Hello and welcome to Veterans Remember. My name is Dick Gooding, Hopkin and Veteran, and your host of Veterans Remember. On the show, we talk to Hopkin and Veterans, young and old, who have proudly served our country in wartime and in peace. Hopkin and has a rich heritage of military service, and our veterans' experiences have helped to shape our nation through the years. These conversations are chronicled on Vet Veterans Remember, broadcast on HCAM TV and available in our schools and libraries for all Hopkintonians to view, particularly our school-aged children. Veterans Remember is also now in the archives at the Library of Congress and at the Army Heritage Foundation. Joining us today on Veterans Remember is Gene Flannery, a longtime resident of Hopkinton and uh, uh, somebody that I go back a number of years ago when he worked in the school system. Gene, I'd like to welcome you to Veterans Remember. Thank you. And uh, maybe you could start off by uh, telling us how you got to Hopkinton to begin with. Well, well I, was, I was born in Framingham. We were, lived in Saxonville until 1944. We moved to Hopkinton. My father worked for Western Nurseries. Uh, was he working at Western Nurseries? He was working at Western. Before they moved to Hopkinton? He, wor he worked in Western. Right. And then when they bought Western Nurseries in Hopkinton, then he moved to Hopping we moved to Hoppington. Boy, he must have been uh, employee number one or two, wasn't he? Yeah, pr pretty close to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had a large family, too, didn't you, Gene? Uh, eight boys, eight girls. Yeah, and they stretched over a long period of time. I know I have a Flannery in my uh, uh, a year ahead of me, I guess it was. Uh, your youngest brother? Uh, David. No, it would be... Would be uh, no, it must be. Is there Ernie? Ernie, Ernie's next to the youngest. Okay, as Ernie was a year older school. than me, I believe. Ernie's yeah. down in Cape now. Uh, and, a, and a lot of them served in the military as well, right? Six boys and one girl. Hmm. There's three in the Army, three in the Marine Corps, and my sister was in the Air Force. Wow. Uh, that's, uh, that's a uh, pretty rich heritage in your own family, not just in town. Yes. Must have been interesting growing up on Western Nurseries, too. Yeah. Well, it, it actually was pretty good. We had a uh, pretty good time. Yeah. I always worked at Western Nurseries. I, act, I worked there from 13 till I was 16. After schools, uh, weekends, whatever uh, measure would let me work, mm -hmm. I worked. You went into the military pretty early, didn't you? Sixteen. Why did you Why did you go in at such a tender young age, Jim? I did not like school, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really didn't know what to do. So I went down to the recruiting office, and it was two weeks before I turned seventeen, and they said, "If you get your parents to sign, you can join." So I got my mother. My father wouldn't sign, my mother, but my mother signed. So I joined, and I spent my 17th birthday at boot camp at Paris Island. <laughs> you went to Paris Island for, for boot camp? Yes. And uh, uh, did you stay a, a grunt, or did you uh, get involved with other training? In, in Paris Island, you stay a grunt. Mm -hmm. after, after boot camp in November, I ended up in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And went training there in machine guns and tanks. And I ended up in tanks as a gunner. Uh, stayed there until July of 1950, after the Korean War broke out, and I ended up in Camp Pendleton in California. Mm -hmm. From Camp Pendleton, I went to Camp Del Mar which was tanks and Amtraks for training. And this is just just as the Korean War had broken out? The Korean War broke out in June, and I ended up in July in uh, Camp Pendleton. Yeah. And Camp Del Mar was, uh, was specialized in tanks and Amtraks. And so were you assigned to a specific uh, battalion or regiment? Or? At that time, no. It, it was just training. I see. Uh, I, I didn't get really assigned until Japan. And so you went from California to J Japan? To, to Kobe, Japan. 
And there, I don't remember the name of the base that we did training at. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time that I seen our tanks was a M26 Persian tank. And there, we stayed roughly 10 days. And in September 2nd, we went aboard ship. Actually, actually it was a Japanese LST, mm -hmm. the crew was. And we ended up landing in Incheon on September 15th. Now, you say landing at Incheon. Is this the famous Incheon landing that we've all heard about uh, in, yes. in military history? Yes, it's the famous one with the big differential in tides. I think it has one of the highest tides in the world and the lowest, There's like almost 20 foot difference. Wow. And they had to land on high tide. And did, I, you, did you know that you were going to Incheon when you were on the boat or uh, when did they when did they let you know what what your mission was when we got there <laughs> when you got there <laughs> probably the officers knew but we we didn't really know until yeah and we're uh, and, and at this point you were organized in in a, uh, a regular marine regiment then like first tank battalion first marine division okay and and we're your uh, officers all well trained, or uh... yes, yeah, so officers are all, all well trained. Uh, most of the, or probably half the men were reservists. Uh, probably a lot had served in World War II as well. The, uh, I'd say most of the company I was in half of it was World War II veterans. Oh, okay. And when was the equipment new? New equipment? The tanks new? The tanks. This tank here, the the M twenty six, was actually developed for the end of World War Two, and they used them in Germany the last few months. Hmm. Something to offset the Tiger tanks. Oh, I see. It had a ninety millimeter. Where German tanks had it with eighty eight, most of them. Mm -hmm. And this tank was equivalent or better. Hmm. So, and and when you landed in Incheon, uh, did you run into uh, fierce resistance, or was the? I'd say the the men on the ground, we'd call them grunts or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call them, uh, they ran into fierce fierce resistance in a tank, unless they have artillery or mortars or or other tanks, you don't really run into what you call. And at the time, as I as I recall, in doing a little bit of research, uh, the North the North Koreans were on the run at that point. They were surprised by the Incheon landing, and uh, uh, General MacArthur, uh, who was revered and uh, scorned at the same time, uh, believed that they were uh, about to give up and wanted to chase them to the Yalu River. That that wasn't Incheon. That was after after. From Incheon, it's about 20 miles up to Seoul. Mm -hmm. After after we took Seoul, they were more or less on the run. I see. But at Incheon, they thought they could stop the First Marine Division at Incheon. But the, my own opinion: North Koreans were lousy soldiers. The North Koreans were lousy soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, that certainly changed when. Uh, uh, you ran into a pretty large amount of uh, later. Chinese uh, yes. communists that as was, well. That was quite a bit later. Yeah. Incheon was in September, and we didn't really run into the Chinese until November. Now, there was a landing, uh, a marine landing on the other side of Korea, too, and, and you were involved in that as yes. well? Yes. Explain how that worked. After, after we took Seoul, MacArthur kicked us out because he wanted a big parade for Sigma and Reed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we ended up back in Incheon to get aboard LSTs again and ended up going around, around Korea, the southern, end of the, southern end of the peninsula and landing at Wonsan on the other side. And from Wonsan, and Wonsan, almost no opposition. And that, that was in North Korea? It's almost on the line, Wonsan is. And from Wonsan, we, we went up to uh, Hamhung. That's a big port on the coast of North Korea. I see. 
And from there, with, through MacArthur's wisdom, we ended up heading towards the mountains. And, and the, uh, uh, as I recall, the chosen uh, reservoir is in, in the middle of the mountains? The, it chosen reservoir is almost at the end of the mountains, going up from Ham Hung to the chosen reservoir is something like over 75 miles. I think they figured 78. And in between it is the three main towns were called Coterie, Hagaru, and the one on the chosen reservoir was Udamne. And the uh, things went very quickly chasing the North Koreans. And, uh, you know, as I recall, the lines got pretty well extended for the, for the troops, both the Army troops as well as the Marines. Yes, they got extended a lot, but General Smith was kind of suspicious. We were running into Chinese units here and there, and uh, he decided he would drag his feet a little. He wasn't going to push like MacArthur wanted to keep push, push, pushing. Yeah, a, 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 another historical uh, significant point in that in that war, certainly, and the the intelligence on the ground with General Smith uh, said the Chinese communists were there in a big way, and uh, the experts and I put that in in parentheses or quotations uh, back in in uh, Japan said, oh no no they're not uh, they're not going to they're not going to come down here and. Unfortunately, MacArthur listened, uh, listened to them rather than the people on the ground. Yeah, that's abs absolutely right. There, there was a couple uh, uh, South Korean divisions that were going up there, too. They, I think they call them ROKs, Republic of Korea right. Army. And they were running into a lot more of the Chinese than actually we were, and they were reporting big groups of Chinese here and there, but nobody, nobody would listen to them. Yeah, and I think history has said that there were as many as 10 divisions of, uh, of Chinese in, in, the, in that area. Uh, 120,000. Yeah, 120,000, yeah. and what was there, like 30,000 uh, Americans? Is up in the Chosen, I think there was less than that. There was uh, around 15 thousand at the most between well in the Marine Corps you had two two regiments were up there uh, I'm not sure of how many army were up there mm -hmm. the army were on a different side of the mountain we went up one side and they went up the other side it, it uh, they kind of split the groups yeah and and what was it around Thanksgiving uh, is that when the uh, the real significant fighting broke out where we uh, finally realized uh, what they were up against? I think it was, I'm not really sure of the date, November 22nd or 27th, I think okay. it was right around there, that it really broke out and they just kept coming, coming and coming. In uh, human waves? Human waves. Really? And uh, what about uh, you know, armaments. Uh, did they have tanks and? Uh, no, and, they they uh, had they had big, a lot of World War II uh, weapons, a lot of Russian, mostly Russian weapons. Uh, their favorite was the burp gun, which is a sure. Russian Russian with Tommy gun. Yeah. Uh, a lot of mortars. Not much artillery. Mm -hmm. No tanks. So uh, that, that allowed us a little bit of a, I, I don't want to call it an advantage because it's kind of hard to overcome a, a five to one in manpower, but uh, a technological advantage as far as some of the weaponry. The biggest advantage we had was the Air Force. The Air Force. We had uh, a lot of support from our Army and, mm -hmm. and Marines, plus our, our Australia had a squadron up there too. Yeah. They were flying in and out. The, 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 the fight that went on there was dubbed the Frozen Chosen. 
Uh, explain the, the meaning of, uh, of what, that, what that entails. Well, the average temperature probably would be, the coldest night was 38 below zero. And this isn't wind chill, this is uh, absolute cold, Cold, uh, 38 degrees I below think, zero I, I Fahrenheit. Think, I think somebody figured it out that it would have ended up 80 below zero if you figured in the wind chill factor. 80 below zero. But the, the average was 20, 25 below zero. Mm. So it, in addition to, to fighting off an enemy, you're uh, trying to survive uh, the cold, which had to be uh, pretty dreadful as well. Uh, probably half the casualties were cold. Really? F yeah. Feet, frozen feet, frozen hands. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of Chinese, that if they were taken prisoners, they wore sneakers, and yeah. what, what, the only thing uh, that they used to do, they used to put straw in the sneakers to absorb the moisture, so they would freeze, free, wouldn't freeze as fast. Oh, I see. And uh, huh. they had all kinds of little tricks, but they were. Now, at some point, uh, uh, it was apparent that the, the numbers were so overwhelming of, of Chinese communists that the decision was made, uh, uh, and they called it a breakout as opposed to a retreat. I'm, I'm not sure what the difference is, but uh, <laughs> I, I know Marines don't like the word retreat. But uh, uh, there was the, you know, the decision to try to get out of the chosen and uh, get back down to the sea. Uh, and, uh, and about that time, you you got involved in that. Can you explain how uh, how that happened? Well, we were at. Not, not at the town of you damn near on the Chosen, the company I was with. We were down into, uh, kind, of, kind of hard for to remember. I think it was a town called Coterie, mm -hmm. which was probably, let's see, over 30 miles away. Mm -hmm. And another company took one tank from Coterie and drove it up to you damn knee on the Chosen Reservoir. And they abandoned the tank. Nobody really knew who had been in the tank till they found it a little later. And Colonel Davis of the First Marines, he was up at uh, Chosen Reservoir. And I think it was another Colonel Litzenberg too. They called back to division to get a crew to fly up or come up to get the tank going. They were going to use the tank in the breakout. And we ended up, I ended up in the crew that was chosen to go up to Chosen Reservoir. And we ended up flying up in helicopters, which one of the first they ever used in the wars. Oh, that must have been scary in its own right. <laughs> yeah, they, they couldn't fly actually that high. They had the plexiglass bubble, mm -hmm. two people plus the pilot. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were being shot at all the way up. So we took fan belts and batteries and whatever we needed to get the tank going. And it took us probably close to th three days to really get it going. Right. And, and during those three days, there was a war going on around yeah. you, and you were getting shot at pretty much. Shot at pretty most, more mortars than, right. other than rifle fire or machine gun fire. More mortars were dropping in more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we got the tank going. I th we ended up putting a fire underneath it, warming the oil up. And finally, that did it to get the tank open. And uh, things are kind of a little sketchy. <laughs> well, and, and I imagine, and, and uh, Gene was, was kind enough to bring us a picture that I'll, uh, I'll show of, uh, of your tank. And this was uh, the only tank in the, the only, leading the leading The only lead? tank for 15 miles, 14 or 15. I think it's 15, pretty close to that. And, and the, the, the significance of being able to get this tank going was, was what? The, we led 
Colonel Davis took off over the mountains on the right hand side mm -hmm. and down the base of the mountains was this one lane road and the between the the fifth marines took off down the main road and the tank led the column from the reservoir to a town called Hagaroo which was where the main body of the Chinese were. Now, when you say led the column, were, were, were these guys marching or were they in? Fighting in, all the way. Fighting all the way. They weren't in deuce and a half going on 40 miles an hour. No. No, no. no. This was a, and, and this tank was, I assume, was clearing the way and was constantly, and you were the gunner. Yes, I was the gunner. And was that the big gun or the, or, or the, the machine guns? 90 millimeter. Yeah. 90 millimeter and on in the bow you had a uh, 30 caliber and we hit between four and five roadblocks I'm not sure how many that the Chinese set up 90 millimeter took care of the roadblocks so uh, they had nothing nothing to, to not, go against nothing, the 90 nothing millimeter. could stop it yeah you had so many bullets were hitting the tank it felt like hail almost hmm. Now, how did you keep uh, you know th those gun those bullets that go into a 90 millimeter aren't small? How did you keep supplied with ammunition and with fuel? The fuel was the hardest part. The ammunition wasn't too bad. But the tank, uh, we had I don't know how many rounds the 26 would carry, but we had a full load of ammunition. 30 caliber we ran out of. Gas we ran out of. Had a scrounge. So, so supply trucks uh, wound up uh, being left behind because you took all the fuel out? The gas, yeah. <laughs> but the ammunition was uh, 30 caliber, we had a scrounge, but uh, 90s we had, we had enough 90. And how many days did it take to... Uh, uh, the to 14 miles action? was close to three days. Close to three days? And that's under constant, constant. Attack, 24 hours a day? 24 hours a day. Wow. 37 below zero. Well, say the average 25. Mm. And the tank was cold as, as outside, if not colder. Yeah, I imagine so. Now, uh, so when you were able to clear that uh, 14 miles and, and get out of the, the chosen area, uh, we'd lost a lot of troops, both Army and Marines at that point. Do you have any sense as to how you know how many troops we lost during that? I I really don't, yeah. uh, but I know some companies are down to uh, probably thirty men. Yeah, and and uh, what were there ten to fifteen thousand that uh, you brought out? Uh, you brought down the road and got out of the chosen area. Or were there more than that? Uh, Probably around twelve, mm -hmm. twelve thousand counting. Uh, we we picked up a lot of uh, soldiers that were caught in the ice too. The mm -hmm. Chinese really did a job in the army. Mm. They they shot them all to heck. Yeah, yeah. That was a that was a certainly a dreadful experience. Yeah. Now, uh, shortly thereafter, after the after that experience, which took you into the beginning of the new year. Uh, you rotated back to the to the states. We ended up the the first Marine Division ended up going the from the Chosen Reservoir all the way back to Ham Hung. And Ham Hung, they evacuated everybody, Marines, Army, plus a hundred thousand Korean civilians, and ended up going back all the way around to not Pusan, Maison. Oh, Mm -hmm. I think it was Maison, Korea. Mm -hmm. It was down at the southern tip of the right. peninsula. Hmm. And uh, when did you leave Korea? I left Korea in April. I was there roughly nine months. And, and you went back to Quantico, is that correct? I went back to uh, California, mm -hmm. but not. I, I didn't stay too long. I ended up in Quantico. In Quantico, I was uh, MP, 
and I did most of my prison chase in eastern Mississippi, picking up you know, anybody that... Uh, you must have been, what, the ripe old age of 18 or 19 at this point in time? <laughs> I turned... Actually, I was 18. Yeah. Hmm. And you left the Marines and uh, came back to Hopkinton. I left the Marines and went to Oklahoma. Oh. I married a girl. My wife's from Oklahoma. And we got married in Washington, D.C. in May of 52. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back to Hopkinton? No work in Oklahoma. No work in Oklahoma. <laughs> so I came back to uh, Oklahoma, I mean uh, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up working for Western Nurseries for probably 15, 16 years. And I think I first met you, you were working in the school system. And you spent a few years in the school system, I spent too. 20 years in the school system. Yeah. 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 Well, Gene, uh, your experience in The Chosen is certainly uh, one that uh, uh, our viewers are probably very pleased to have heard. Uh, I don't think any of us can recognize what 37 degrees below Fahrenheit, uh, below zero Fahrenheit is like, not to speak of being shot at by uh, communist troops. Uh, but uh, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly a fascinating experience, and we thank you very much for your service, and uh, thank you very much for coming back to, uh, to Hopkinton to uh, share this experience with us uh, today, and uh, we know the the Flannerys have been around here for a long time, and I think they'll be around here for a long time to come. So uh, I'd like to, uh, again, thank Gene for uh, joining us today on Veterans Remember. And uh, once again, I'm Dick Gooding, your host, and uh, Veterans Remember gives our veterans in Hopkinton an opportunity to share with us their experiences both in Hopkinton and their experiences in war and peace in their military service. So I want to thank you very much for joining us today, and have a good day.